Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome today's first speaker, Danielle Edwards, Executive Vice President of Ipsos Online Communities. Danielle, you have the floor. Thank you, Ellen, um, and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'm excited to share a little information about the uh, rich insights that we found coming out of our Ipsos syndicated community, Fresh Lab. Um, so just before we dive into the results, uh, a little bit about communities at Ipsos. So Fresh Lab is our syndicated community. We have about 7,000 members. Um, and they're profiled on several different uh, demographics, including, you know, where they shop, cars they drive, products they purchase, and then obviously all of the standard information around children in the home and household income. Um, but members are engaged. Uh, they're ready to participate in a variety of quantitative and qualitative methodologies, including live chats, surveys, and in-depth qual. Uh, it's a very a agile uh, and affordable tool when you want to connect co with consumers um, on a variety of different topics. Um, and then next slide, please. So for this research, um, our goal was really understanding how brands can make better decisions around sustainability. So to get at that, uh, we did both quantitative and qualitative research. So for the qualitative, we asked members to um, imagine some of their favorite brands as guests at a dinner party that was sustainability themed. So we asked them questions around who would they invite and why, you know, what would you want to discuss with this brand? And uh, so we really uh, generated some really deep, rich verbatims. And then we also had a quantitative survey as well. So we had about 982 members participate over a span of a week in uh, early October. <clears throat> so next slide. Um, and so then, like I mentioned, we had a lot of really rich verbatims and quantitative data coming out of this research. So the team uh, for the next remainder of the webinar will take you through four key areas uh, that we really dove into and explored. So first, you know, what is the consumer's definition of its sustainability? What does that really mean to them? And then, um, you know, why it's important to them, where brands need to focus, and then finally, um, how to communicate you know their efforts in the space so all of that kind of really tying in at the end determining you know the most important strategy how to execute and what messaging is really important to consumers around the area of sustainability so now I will go ahead and hand it off to Henry who will go through some of the qualitative results cool thank you Danielle So a good place to start when it comes to sustainability is really understanding what this really means to consumers. It's a word that you see hearing a lot in conversations and it sort of becomes sort of this nebulous topic. And before sort of taking action, you kind of want to understand what consumers view is when it comes to sustainability. And really that will help sort of guide action on that topic. So we had conversations with our members and really sort of understanding what, how they define sustainability. What was interesting is that how they viewed it really sort of focused on different aspects of a product's life cycle. So it kind of connects where it's sourced from, what, you know, the product, the materials that are used, how it's processed, um, how long it will last. Is this product for something that I'm going to one use thing? Is it going to be something that I can use multiple times? And then how can it be reused? And this is a bit different than sort of usage. It's really more about repurposing. You know, is this something that after it sort of outlived its life cycle or outlived its specific use, can it be repurposed for something else? So that way they're not disposing of it fairly quickly. And then finally, what can they do to outlive, what can they do with the product after the it's outlived its usefulness? How do they sort of understand clearly in regards to recycling and disposing of the product? Uh, so they really sort of understand in this case where where this product sort of exists in this process and really knowing at each stage of the process what is how is it sustainable. And we actually pulled out a really great quote from one of our Fresh Lab members, and it's kind of a clear just ad indication of just that entire thing. And in essence, they said, you know, all of the ingredients should be natural and organically raised the way our earth is not uh, poisoned by chemicals. 
Everything should be compostable, reusable, or recyclable. Sustainability to me is much more than being responsible when it comes to recycling. It's more. It's working hand in hand with the earth we are on, never irreparably damaging it in any way. And everything is made able to go back into to generate more good use. And this is a really good sort of descriptor of how folks are seeing it, that it's not just recycling. It goes way beyond that and the entire process of the product. So we get a sense of what it's, uh, how we sort of define it, but then in the normal consumer shopping experience, how really important it is. For the most part, consumers view sustainability as having some importance when they're shopping for products, but when you sort of compare it to everything else, it, it falls a little bit towards the end in being extremely important, where in relation to things such as paying a high price and something being available. And we'll talk about a little bit more later how that plays out in relation to each other, but broad speaking, folks find it important, but just, there are certain things to them, in this, especially in this climate, that are much more important to them when they're purchasing products. But not everyone sees it equally and similarly. Taking a look at the demographics of folks who participate in this study, they, the younger audiences tend to see uh, sustainability much more important than older uh, consumers. So they're really seeing that a difference for them. And we'll talk a little bit more later on sort of where the threshold lies for them when it comes to that uh, aspect, especially when it comes to trade-offs. But not everyone thought to say that sustainability is important. So we sort of probed a bit more among our members and really just tried to figure out why isn't sustainability important to them and really sort of fell into five different buckets. The first aspect is just they have no control. They see themselves as one individual. They don't feel as something that just because, you know, people talk about sustainability that they don't have a direct impact. As you noted, saw earlier, price and availability are much more important to them. So those factors really just are driving their decision making when shopping and not something that's sustainable. And they also have sort of habits and products that they already purchased. So trying to see, you know, try seeing the idea of buying a different product because it's sustainable is not really something that's interesting to them. They rather have sort of keep the products that they current purchase and really not really deviate beyond that. Also, it comes sort of the baggage that comes with it. Uh, it we'll, see, we'll note later that, you know, when folks start thinking about sustainability, price kind of connects with it. And the concern is that if you make something sustainable, that the product is be much more expensive. So they really, there's that sort of baggage that comes with it, that there might be some opportunity to sort of uh, disconnect those two so that folks would be much more interested in it. And lastly, as you see, when we looked at the people, how people define sustainability, it's all over the place in the different product life cycle that for them, it's really unclear and meaningless, so for some unclear and meaningless definition. Uh, some folks even mentioned that it's sort of connection to the idea of going green. Like, what does that really mean to me? So there's opportunity here to sort of communicate that to uh, shoppers when it comes specifically for your brands on what sustainability is for you. And that way you can own that aspect and really connect with consumers in that way. So with this broad foundation of how consumers use sustainability, it, which again touches upon different aspects of a product life cycle, we want to see really then how it comes into action for consumers. At the first step, we really just asked first, you know, when it comes to sustainability, who really is responsible? Is it the brands? Is it individuals? And for the most part, more than half folks tend to associate brands being responsible in that space. It's not overwhelming, and we'll see a little bit later that there's sort of a, a connection, or a tug of war in that aspect, but at least there's some, you know, basically a little bit more than half will sort of see that the brands have some responsibility in the different areas. So as, as I mentioned earlier, the feeling of responsibility sort of creates a tension between uh, brand, and brand and individual responsibility. For folks that see that brands are more responsible for the uh, sustainability, the reasons they say is that, you know, they have control of the product, product life cycle, whether from sourcing, production, selling, and so on, and, ma and marketing. And the consumers need to see the choices available so they actually can purchase the products that are sustainable. They feel that they don't see the options, they're not going to purchase them, so they want to see that. And for them, they see brands as having the money and resources to actually make that change. But not everyone feels that way. For some consumers, they actually feel that they have the power to do that. And for them, they should be creating that demand for, for, to, for have products that are sustainable. So telling brands that we want that. And they would basically would do it with their financial power. So with their products. So they're going to pick maybe niche products that are sustainable, but eventually we sort of, you know, cascade and cause a way for larger brands to be participating in this. 
And also they just feel that, you know, individuals really should be more in, uh, educated before they start purchasing sustainable products so they can know what that really means to them. But being sustainable really is, can't, it can't really exist in a vacuum. There are some changes that will need to be made to have products be sustainable. And for our members, they're really sort of a range of what things can happen to things to be sustainable. Regardless of ownership of consumers, uh, consumers have some acceptable trade-offs. So for example, uh, packaging and ingredients really are fine when it comes to that. That's really sort of okay. Acceptability does start to wane though when it impacts on variety and things like just sizes and styles. But then it becomes much more prohibitive when it impacts on overall availability and even pricing. So this is likely something that's you know definitely much more impactful because of inflation, let's say. But really, these are sort of the things that folks don't really want to have impacted when they see products as being sustainable. However, not everyone feels directly that way. When we sort of parse out the data among our members, younger audiences are much more open to have products, you know, maybe less availability or being late or things with higher prices, if it means that the products can be sustainable. It's not as strong as you see as you get older, but overall, younger audiences tend to be that way, which does give some ideas on products that may be, you know, marketed as being sustainable so that you're not really changing your entire suite of offerings, but maybe things that are much more targeted toward younger audiences who may be more acceptable to that. We did have a small group of audience members of folks who said that they were not really interested in any particular trade-offs. And the biggest drivers are really just that they don't want to see any compromises or anything that's really impacting them. They feel that brands who are choosing to be sustainable really should basically take the brunt of the impact because it's something that they should they are responsible for. Um, and really should not really should pass on or sort of, you know, dilute or sort of trickle down any of the impact on them. And that really connects to sort of the things that we had seen earlier about pricing and availability being sort of impacted. That's not something that they want to see. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Brittany, who's going to talk a bit more about the product perspective. Awesome. Thanks, Henry. So as we've kind of demonstrated, there is no one single opinion when it comes to environmental sustainability, right? And to help break this down further, Ipsos has conducted a proprietary global segmentation of over about 10,000 people addressing themes related to beliefs and attitudes towards the environment and climate change, their willingness to act, their purchase behaviors, and in short, just how people feel and what they do. And we found five different segments, um, but these really can be defined by two primary factors. And you'll see those on the chart here. It's people's concern about the environment, as well as their willingness to act against it, right? So there is a really wide range of opinions here. And what that means is that brands can't have a singular focus when communicating or innovating in pursuit of sustainability. And in fact, what we find is that in order to engage multiple of these segments, it's often necessary to present sustainability benefits as a co-benefit of your product or of your service rather than the primary benefit of it. Um, but let's talk a little bit about where there are the biggest gains to be made. So if we move to the next slide, you'll see that generally people think sustainability is most important when it comes to the products and services that we use every day. So what this question shows here is that for the same set of verticals, we ask people both the importance of brands acting sustainably or in a sustainable manner, and separately the importance of the specific products or services individuals buy being sustainable, right? So kind of teasing a brand responsibility versus an individual responsibility here. And as we saw earlier, generally, people are placing greater importance on the brand's actions um, versus the impact of any singular purchase decision. So there's a slightly larger emphasis here on the overall brand activity than on those individual products and services. Um, in addition, we tend to place greater importance on sustainability when it comes to the products we're using every day, those more frequent touch points. Things like paper products, cleaning laundry, food and beverage, even automobiles, as opposed to things like air travel, furniture, so forth. And it's interesting because even in these everyday categories, however, 
there are many factors that are going to drive our purchase decisions, as we talked about in the beginning of this presentation. And those real life factors lead us to what we call the say, choose gap. Um, to illustrate this, we have some additional research on research in which we asked consumers which materials they perceived to be the most eco-friendly in the area of food and beverage. So the top response you'll see here was paper or carton, followed by glass with plastic and metal lagging pretty far behind. And if we build this page here, we also screened some ideas for product packaging. Um, we made up concepts using a, a fictitious brand of ready to drink coffee and used a dual approach in which we put many of these, pa these pack steps side by side to kind of put some rubber to the road and see what choices consumers make um, even after they told us about which materials they perceive to be sustainable. The various concepts are shown here in rank order and big surprise, people didn't necessarily choose the most sustainable option as their preferred option. Um, the carton, which people would have perceived as perhaps the most sustainable, trends towards the back of the pack if we follow these kind of teal bars on screen. And in this case, it seems that consumers are actually tending towards the category norms for a product of this type, something like glass or, pats or plastic, rather than seeking necessarily the most eco-friendly option. And if we continue to the next slide, I think that we can all admit that at times we all like what's familiar to us, right? So as we saw with some of those quotes earlier, people can be suspicious of change. And as a result, when products or packaging are changed, um, brands really need to consider the holistic product usage experience. So we're gonna walk through a few examples of um, air quoting heavily simple packaging changes to, under, to kind of illustrate how we might consider that usage experience. So if we first take this example of Coca-Cola's Keel Clip, which is a paperboard carrier that's meant to replace those plastic rings we've all been told are, are so bad. Um, this is likely a pretty low risk change. This is a secondary packaging. It's not necessarily going to interact or uh, upset the way I interact with the can itself, assuming this thing works and I've told it works very well. Um, and as a result, this kind of falls within that bucket of newer different packaging that consumers would find pretty acceptable. If we build on another example, however, this is a pasta box in which the, the plastic window was removed to just eliminate the use of plastic on this packaging. And again, this is only a pack change, meaning the product inside hasn't changed, but it, it kind of does impact perhaps my shopping experience and that I'm no longer able to vet the quality of the pasta I'm buying before I take this home. But there's also perhaps another touch point in which this sits in my cupboard and I use that window as a way to kind of cue me to pick up more pasta at the shop if it's low, if it's below that line. This is another way in which your interaction with that product is fundamentally going to be different as a result of this packaging change. As a result, kind of a few additional things to consider there. And I'd say that the highest risk scenario we have on this slide would be this Johnny Walker paper-based bottle. So this technology is inspiring. It is very cool to move from a glass bottle to a paper bottle, but the launch will require some careful thought about consumers' expectations, needs states when making when making choices for, for spirits, because you can imagine um, if people are very proud to display the current black label bottle on their bar cart, will they feel the same way about this new paper-based bottle? And in addition, this current glass bottle might prime me for a very premium, a smooth drinking experience with even the tactile nature of the bottle. What impact does paper have on that experience and what I expect of that engagement with the brand? So in many cases, embarking upon these initiatives is as much or even in some cases more about mitigating risk than it is about seeing a, a, a sudden increase in sales, right? So then we might ask on the next slide, why should we care if there's not necessarily um, an immediate revenue gain? Why do we care? And, and to answer that, we really do need to take a bit of a broader view. So we continually monitor global concerns in our monthly What Worries the World survey, where we really just ask people, what is their top priority, their top concern at the moment? And as you can see on this chart, which lists uh, climate change along with other topics like inflation and coronavirus, 
Consumer expectations and demands for more sustainable practices are higher now than they ever have been, but they've also withstood pressures of the pandemic. They're withstanding pressures related to inflation. And it's not a question of when companies should pursue a sustainability agenda, but really how they should go about it. So luckily for that, Henry is going to give us some pointers about how to effectively communicate some of these efforts. Cool. Thank you, Brittany. So as Daniel mentioned very early on, we did basically a two-phase approach on this research. And this, this part sort of was an interesting where we had our members take part in the discussion with our moderators. And the way that we had sort of set up is that we gave them a scenario saying, if you were to host a dinner party, you know, inviting your, fam you know, your favorite brands, you know, and the topic of sustainability came up, what are some things that you want to sort of expect to hear from them? What are some things you'd like to hear from them? And then interestingly at the end, uh, if you know the next day after I sort of send you a thank you note uh, for hosting them for dinner, uh, what's sort of that one sentence you'd want to hear back from them when it comes to sustainability? And note that this is, you know, a very different research method that we use qualitatively where it's sort of a discussion aspect. And we have moderators basically probing folks to sort of discuss more. So we don't just get sort of the initial responses on individual questions that our moderator will go back into the platform with our members and sort of ask, oh, could you tell me more about this? Oh, could you explain a bit more? Allowing us to get more deeper with our members and give additional data points in the analysis. Let's see here. So to that end, we came up in the conversations, we ended up with basically four different areas of topics when it comes to sustainability that they'd like to hear. And I'll go a little more deeper in the next couple of slides, but overall it sort of covers an area sort of the brand sustainable efforts, sharing information and efforts with other brands, how consumers can partner with other brands in this area, and really balancing the consumer needs, which will be very familiar from the stuff that we talked about a little bit, a little bit earlier. So really sort of the, for, the first part, so sustainability efforts. From a communication perspective, co uh, consumers want to hear how brands are basically helping uh, the world when it comes to sustainability in each stage of the process. They're already defining it in different ways. So being able to communicate in those areas is going to be important. How are our objects sourced? How long will products last? Interesting, interestingly, in the reusing aspect, they want to hear how can I actually use this product beyond its life cycle. So, you know, they think of sort of you think of those crafty websites that people talk about where, oh, you can use this product for this as an alternative way. So being able to sort of communicate that to consumers will help them understand like how they can use it beyond that. And then lastly, sort of the recycled disposal aspect, you know, being clear and communicating how folks can actually leverage the materials in a, or rather recycle the materials in a way that they're doing it responsibly and sustainably. One interesting thing that came up, and this came up from that second box about sharing with brands, is you know they see sustainability as an effort, as a, a shared effort across brands. They don't see sustainability as being successful if one brand just does it. So they're thinking that if you know very successful brands are able to be sustainable in certain ways, that they're actually able to share their knowledge with lesser sustainable brands, and being able to that way become sort of a joint effort and actually communicating that effort to them so they can see that there's sort of a brand uh, halo effect and sort of a, a positive view on brands because they're able to sort of take this you know information, share with others, and seeing as a, it's a shared effort to be successful. But that partnership should not just be with the brand themselves, but also involve the consumers. And for them, they want to know really clearly how they can be a part of this process. And, in, and it, it's a very explicitly noting that has to be very clear for them. You sort of think about sort of, you know, from a recycling perspective, uh, from a recycling perspective, they'll see sort of those little triangles on the on the containers and being clear on not having a clear understanding of how to recycle. They really want to know how to really use, reuse those product, uh, products and how to recycle them clearly. So if there are clear ways to sort of repurpose them, they'd like to know and having that communication being clear for them really helps them be a part of that process and not be ambiguous towards them. And the last of the four is really sort of the balancing the consumer needs. They would like to see sustainable products exist. They think it's a really great idea, but don't impact how their, you know, the pricing availability of their products. Um, their concern is that it's going to obviously impact their shopping behaviors, but also just they don't want to see brands 
uh, view this as sort of a cash grab, like, yeah, we'll be sustainable, but we're going to increase prices with that. They want to see that as a sort of a, a shared effort and being seen as something that it should impact, you know, their main needs when it comes to shopping for products. So to that end, you know, for consumer sustainability is really an important effort for them, especially uh, as uh, Brittany had mentioned earlier for as personal for personal products, that they don't want to see experience any compromises on pricing and availability for that to be successful. Additionally, part of that success does need a partnership with consumers and other brands because it's really a joint effort if we're intention is obviously to help this world and help sort of uh, make this a much better place for everyone. But also you want to make sure they communicate these clearly to them so the shoppers can see that you are making this effort in sustainability and uh, communicating clearly how folks can actually participate in this. And uh, that way they can feel that they're a part of this process in a very clear and actionable way. So that ends the, the, the pre our presentation. So if there's any particular questions they want to ask. Yeah, Henry, we do have a few here. And I think this first one is for you. And it's, are there any other demographic differences besides age when it comes to the importance of sustainability? Uh, good question. So we actually took a look at other demos such as ethnicity and income. We actually came in with a hypothesis thinking that maybe folks who are much more affluent who might have the disposable income to actually feel sustainability, sustainability being more important for them. It didn't really pan out clearly. I think it was basically sort of a, mis a mixture of different perspective. But overall, I think the biggest driver for now is just based on age. And um, a follow up to that, any recommendations on short term actions or long-term actions? Um, I don't know if there's any particular for short-term or long-term. I know obviously, Brittany, you mentioned sort of like the products that they should be considering, like the packaging. I think anything that sort of fits within the needs of packaging or, uh, you know, changes of ingredients that folks are much more open to being sustainable that doesn't impact pricing is probably where uh, brands really should start focusing on. And then, you know, maybe in the communication aspect for long term, seeing where that value comes in for sustainability that might uh, make pricing much more um, palatable. No, I, I think that's exactly right, especially given that for now, consumers are saying that those are the places where they're they're willing to accept a little bit more in terms of trading off for sustainability. Um, there's another question here. What expectations do consumers have in terms of government in, in sustainability? And we didn't explore that within this piece of research, though Ipsos broadly has done research on this topic before. And of course, this would change depending on, on the, the market that you're in. We know that some places their legislation is perhaps further along down the line in terms of sustainability than others. Um, but generally what we see is that while consumers do place the greatest responsibility upon the brands and uh, after that is government followed by individuals themselves. So it's kind of middling between um, gov or brand and individual responsibility. And in addition, I see many questions related to the segmentation. Um, know that there is much more to come on that very soon. There will be a, a full published paper available on this within the next few days. So, so tune back in for more on that. And with that, um, I'm going to thank you all for your time today. Um, if we haven't gotten to your question here, I, I believe we've covered them. Um, oh, actually, perhaps there's one more. And this is, I guess, a new question about the segmentation, um, about the different profiles. And actually, we could voice over quickly what those are. If you wanted to flip back to the slide with the segmentation, Henry, I can sure. speak very broadly to those. Sure. So as I mentioned, there's really kind of two primary factors that people fell against, and that was their level of concern for the environment, as well as their willingness to act upon that concern. And luckily, the names are pretty self-explanatory in terms of things like activists. These are people who feel like it's a climate crisis, we need to act now, and they're willing to sacrifice their, their kind of lifestyle as a result. Um, the pragmatists the pragmatists here have a moderate level of concern and they're willing to do kind of low cost, home oriented updates to their routine, um, but will make some trade offs when necessary. The, the busy bystanders and conflicted contributors are really interesting in that they do think that 
the climate crisis is a concern, except there are kind of bigger barriers for them to act. For busy bystanders, it's all about they don't want to sacrifice convenience. They don't want to switch up their routine or the products they buy. Whereas with conflicted contributors, their primary barrier is more related to, to finances. They're, they're not able to or don't aren't willing to pay more for sustainable options. And finally, the disengaged denialists, these are folks who either don't think climate change is something that we need to be worried about or thinks that the worry about that is overblown. And I was starting to say, there will be much more to come on this in the coming days. So again, um, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, for spending some time with us and um, watch out for a recording soon. With that, we'll give you a little bit of your, of your day back and have a, have a great afternoon.